Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here and also a proud member. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ohio's Secretary of State, Frank LaRose. As all of you know, the Secretary of State's most important responsibility is ensuring the administration of fair elections throughout the state. This week, Secretary LaRose announced an initiative to dramatically change voter registration practices, creating an opt-out system which would automatically register eligible voters unless they choose not to exercise the, their opportunity to vote. It has already garnered significant attention and at least one high-profile endorsement from across the aisle from Congresswoman Marsha Fudge. This all falls under the Secretary's responsibilities as the state's chief elections officer, he also appoints county election boards, chairs the ballot board, which approves all ballot language, and investigates election and voting fraud, among other responsibilities. The, sec the Secretary's office is also responsible for business filings, kind of a baseline set of activities fundamental to creating a strong business environment in the state. Frank LaRose took office on January 14th, 2019. He's a Northeast Ohio native. Secretary LaRose enlisted in the United States Army with 101st Airborne after graduating high school, ultimately serving in the U.S. Special Forces as a Green Beret. During a decade in uniform, he received numerous commendations and honors, including the Bronze Star. He earned a degree from The Ohio State University and spent three years in the private sector before successfully running for an open seat in the Ohio Senate in 2010. As a Republican lawmaker, then Senator LaRose often worked alongside Democrats, introducing bills aimed at improving voting and elections, including making it easier for overseas service members to vote and implementing online voter registration. He, along with three other Ohio senators, spearheaded efforts to reform redistricting in Ohio, and after several years of that effort, a joint resolution passed in 2018, creating what many consider to be a fairer process for drawing congressional district maps. And in an effort to encourage bipartisanship, Secretary LaRose and other young members of the Ohio House and Senate formed the Ohio Future Caucus, dedicated to finding common ground in an era of hyper-partisanship. We're excited to have him, ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Secretary of State Frank LaRose. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. It was almost 20 years ago in a little village just outside of Vatina, Kosovo, something I'll never forget. It was a rainy day, and I was there as a young sergeant in the 101st Airborne Division. Our mission that day was to safeguard a polling location. We were told to stay at least 100 yards back from the polling location because obviously we didn't want to make it look as though uniformed American service members were interfering with their election, but we were there to make sure that it uh, was a safe environment. It was a rainy day, kind of like this, and uh, one of those days that uh, just is seared in, in my memory. I was uh, leaning over the hood of a Humvee and looking through these old green army binoculars. Uh, you know the ones I'm talking about, sir. <laughs> and um, watching something uh, that, that it, again, is seared in, in my memory to this day. Uh, just like we do here, there, uh, many of the polling places were in churches. The churches there are much older than ours, and this one was up on the top of a hill. Uh, it almost looked like something out of a, a cartoon. It was this like cone-shaped hill, really tall with a road that wound up at this gravel, rocky, rutted road. And the people had to get up to the top of that hill in order to cast their vote. I was looking through the binoculars at an elderly woman on a cane who was using a cane, and she was fighting her way up that hill, and you could tell uh, was struggling with it. I wanted so bad to go and, and give her my arm and, and help her up the hill, but of course my orders precluded me from, from doing that. What I'll never forget is the look of determination on her face. This old Kosovar woman knew that something remarkable was at the top of that hill. This woman knew that when she got to the top of that hill, that she was going to have an opportunity to cast a ballot. She was going to have an opportunity to make a decision that could impact the future of the country 
that her children and grandchildren would grow up in. How many of us, unfortunately, in 2019 in Ohio, take that for granted? My love of the democratic process, my love of civic engagement was strengthened that day, and it's something I'll, I'll never forget. I've had other experiences similar to that. When I served in Iraq, I had the opportunity to see free men and women defy the threats of terrorists to cast a ballot. These Iraqi men and women were so proud of that purple finger. They walked out of that polling place and they showed that purple finger. It was almost like an I voted today sticker. Of course, in Iraq, it was their way of keeping people from voting twice. They dipped their finger in ink. Pretty simple. Works every time. They were really proud of that, though. That, that was more than just an I voted today sticker. That purple finger was a badge of courage. You see, they had defied the threats of terrorists that said things like, we would cut your finger off if we saw purple ink on it. And in that election, they showed up at over 70%. Now, our, our friends from the Cuyahoga County Board of Elections can reassure you there's no threats of, of any kind like that here in, in, in Ohio. Um, but we don't very often get a 70% voter turnout. When those Iraqi men and women walked out of the polling place and held that purple finger aloft, they were saying something profound. They were saying, I'm a free man, I'm a free woman, you can't intimidate me, I voted today. I made my voice heard today. Now as Ohio's 51st Secretary of State, I have the opportunity to safeguard that same right for Ohioans. That's something that is truly remarkable. Uh, Dan, thank you for the kind introduction and, and thanks to all of you for, for your interest. Uh, thank you for, for coming out on a rainy Friday to, to hear from Ohio's 51st Secretary of State. And, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to talking to you today about some of the work that our office does um, and about uh, my vision for the future of Ohio and some of the things that we can do uh, when we work together. As you heard me say, my interest in elections didn't begin on the Senate floor. For me, it began on a battlefield, and, uh, and that's something that's profound and, and it stays with me. Of course, uh, I always joke that most people don't know Ohio has a Secretary of State. Uh, I joke that sometimes uh, if you ask someone on the street, they would tell you that the Ohio Secretary of State must be responsible for negotiating peace treaties with Michigan. <laughs> I can assure you that is not one of the powers that this office has, but as a proud Ohio State graduate, I can also assure you that even if it was, I would never negotiate peace with Michigan. <laughs> of course, what this office does is safeguards two things that are really fundamental to our way of life. Think about it like this. The Ohio Secretary of State has the opportunity to protect the right to start and grow a business and the right to engage in our democracy. Or as I like to say, fair elections and free markets. I mean, if there's anything worth fighting for, if there's anything worth striving for, I would argue that those two things that are fundamental to our way of life are worth protecting. And I get to do that every day. And um, it's something that I'm honored to do, along with a, a great team. Uh, we built an excellent team already uh, at the Ohio Secretary of State's office. I'm just over three months into the job, and I'm really proud of the people uh, that, that we have uh, around us at, at the Ohio Secretary of State's office. Now, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about elections today, but I do want to touch briefly on, on the business side of this office. Uh, the Ohio Secretary of State, as I said, has the opportunity to help people start and grow a business. And, uh, and I think of my own family experience with this. 90 years ago, when my great-grandfather, an Italian immigrant, filled out his paperwork and mailed it down to Columbus, and he waited probably weeks for it to come back. And when he tore that envelope open, there was a stamp on it that said, congratulations, LaRose, you're a business owner now. Well, those same stamps are given out by my office today. And whether it's a, 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 an Italian immigrant 90 years ago, or whether it's a woman here in Cleveland who tonight is going to go on my website our website at the Ohio Secretary of State.gov website and fill out the forms necessary to live her American dream, to become an entrepreneur. That's something that's really profound and that's something that we take very seriously and we're going to continue working to make that process as easy as it can be. Oh, there's some other things that, that we've identified as opportunities to help take that to the next level. Uh, we want to help identify people right then and there on the spot uh, to, to get them, uh, for example, an MBE certification. Uh, we want to ask people right there when they become uh, a business owner on our website, uh, are you a woman-owned business, are you a minority-owned business, veteran, disabled, et cetera, so that we can connect them with the opportunities that the state of Ohio provides. Uh, that's something that I take very seriously. We're, we're, we're working on some things to, to combat uh, business identity theft. We all are familiar with the idea of identity theft. Well, it can happen to businesses, too. And we're working to put some things in place to prevent that. And then largely to just be a voice for small business in Ohio. 
Uh, Ohio doesn't have an SBA, uh, but as the, uh, as the uh, Ohio Secretary of State, I can sort of be that state level uh, voice for, for small business and connect them with the Federal Small Business Administration and other aspects of state government that can help them get their start. Of course, when I raised my hand and swore the oath to uh, serve as Ohio Secretary of State, I also became Ohio's Chief Elections Officer. And um, as you heard me say, that's uh, a, a part uh, of, of my life that, that I really relish and, uh, and, and I'm really honored to be able to do. Uh, of course, as I said, uh, with the team that we built at the Secretary of State's office, I don't work alone. And, uh, and, and really, the work of running fair elections for Ohio is done by our 88 county boards of elections. Now think about this. In a time when it seems like Republicans and Democrats can't agree on what day of the week it is, at 88 county boards of elections, including our Cuyahoga County Board of Elections that has uh, a number of representatives here today, at 88 county boards of elections throughout Ohio, Republicans and Democrats come to work in the morning, unlock the door, turn on the lights, and do the complex and difficult work of running elections together. That is a bipartisan success story. And as much as we strive at the Secretary of State's office to support them in their work and make sure that we're running fair elections, the day-to-day -day work of running elections is really done at 88 county boards of elections. Now, as I said, uh, just over three months into the job, in fact, this, this week marked the 100th day uh, in this office. And we've already pursued a number of things uh, that I want to share with you today uh, that are going to work to, to make elections better in the state of Ohio. Uh, one thing that we're working on already is cybersecurity. I think it, uh, it comes as no surprise to any of us that there are bad actors out there who want to uh, undermine the credibility of our elections. Uh, they have a variety of, of ways that they can try to do that. The good news is that we have significant safeguards in place that actually prevent individuals from tampering with the way that we administer elections and actually count votes. Uh, again, that's the, the work that our county boards of elections do. Uh, but one of the ways that they seek to undermine the credibility of our form of, of government and our elections is through cybercrime. Uh, we worked to get a bill introduced, uh, and, and thanks to the leadership in both the House and Senate, uh, are moving that forward called Senate Bill 52 that will make Ohio a leader in the nation for cybersecurity. One of the really exciting components of this bill would be the creation of a thing called the Ohio Cyber Reserve, which essentially is a group of civilian volunteers that fall under the command of the Ohio National Guard and can be activated by the governor uh, and able to respond when disaster strikes. Um, we see examples of this all the time where critical infrastructure comes under attack, where local governments come under attack, and they many times don't have the resources necessary to, to, to manage uh, through those crises. Uh, with the Ohio Cyber Reserve, the best in the business would be available at a moment's notice to jump in a van and come to City Hall or come to the county courthouse uh, to, to help deal with the problem. Uh, I, I've said it's like this, if you looked out the window one day and you saw a foreign military's paratroopers parachuting into Cleveland, we wouldn't say, all right, Cleveland, you got this, you're on your own. Uh, we would activate the National Guard, we would bring in the active duty military, we would muster all of the resources that we have available to defend our territory. Well, we have to do the same thing with cyber attacks. A cyber attack is in every way an attack. It may not be the same as a kinetic or, or a physical world attack, but it has many of the exact same, uh, same impacts. And so we need to make sure that in the year 2019 that we are ready to fight against these kind of things that come up. Something else that we're working on and I'm really proud of uh, is to require a post-election audit in Ohio. This is one of the best ways that we have after the election of being able to tell the voters uh, that, 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 uh, that their confidence was well placed and that the election was well run. It's the way that we can find uh, when there were problems and work to address those. Cuyahoga County again has been a leader on this by implementing a thing called a risk limiting audit. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, nerd out a little bit on this, you can Google it. It's a really interesting topic. It's all about uh, the, the best sort of statistical practice for a post-election audit. But uh, uh, what we're going to require is that in the state of Ohio, uh, under the piece of legislation that I'm supporting, is that after every election, there be a post-election audit. And that's something that I think is really important. Uh, something else that, that I am really excited about, just this week, uh, Governor DeWine signed into law a thing called Senate Bill 30. Simply stated, it creates the Ohio Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. Now think about this. It was less than 100 years ago that women finally received the right to vote. And this is something that's worth celebrating. This is something that's worth marking. And Ohio was a leader then where brave suffragists came out, men and women, by the way, worked hard to finally win this right to vote for women that was long, long overdue. The ratification of the 19th Amendment happened uh, throughout the period of 1919 to 1920. 
In June of 1919, Ohio ratified the 19th Amendment. We were one of the first states to do that. And again, that's consistent with our heritage in Ohio of standing up for voting rights. Uh, but in, in, in 1920, the final state to ratify, to, to reach the constitutional threshold, was the state of Tennessee. So what we envision is that this Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission uh, will help lead a series of events to mark that history that will run from June of this year to August of, of next year. Uh, this is not just about recognizing that history. Of course, that's the context that we recognize these, again, these brave suffragists that did this important work. But even more importantly, this is about educating the next generation of Ohioans, people like my young three daughters, why this right is worth fighting for. Using the story of the suffragist movement to talk about why people fought so hard for this right and why you should not give it up by simply skipping the opportunity to vote. Really excited about the work of the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission and, and so stay tuned uh, to, to that as we, as we move forward with that. Um, something else that, that I'm working on, and many of you may have seen an op-ed that I wrote uh, in the Cleveland Plain Dealer a couple weeks ago about transparency in campaign finances. Uh, the basic idea is this. Anybody that's going to write checks to try to influence the outcome of an election um, should be disclosed. Voters deserve to know who is trying to influence elections. And let's not be naive about this. As long as there has been politics and as long as there have been people with resources, people have tried to employ those resources uh, to help the candidates and causes that they believe in. Nothing wrong there. But what needs to happen is we need to shine a light into the so-called dark money that exists so that voters can make a more informed decision about who is funding these various efforts. Uh, one of the things that's simple to do, and this is an idea that came from Cuyahoga County, is that we need to put local campaign finance records online. Believe it or not, in the year 2019, Ohio law still requires if you are a candidate for local office that you have to submit your campaign finance report in what I call dead tree format at your county board of elections. Now, that is not searchable, it is not as accessible as it should be, and it doesn't meet the expectations that Ohioans have. And so what I want to see is that candidates for local office submit their, uh, their campaign finance records online, just as we do when we run for state office. In fact, for almost 20 years, since 2000, Ohio has had an online system for campaign finance reporting, but it only starts with state offices. It doesn't apply to, to local offices. Uh, something else that I'm, that I'm working on that I'm really excited about, Ohio, as I said, has been a leader in the nation for ease of voting. Uh, it's something that we should be proud of. Ohio has over 200 hours of early voting. That includes in-person voting uh, at a vote center or at your county board of elections. That includes the opportunity to vote on weekends. Uh, there are only 20 states in the nation that allow weekend early voting. Ohio is one of them. And there are only five states in the nation that allow Sunday early voting, only five. And Ohio is one of those as well. And uh, under my leadership, we're gonna continue to do that because it's, a, it's an important thing that uh, many Ohioans have found to be a convenience that they like, particularly faith communities, and particularly in our urban areas, have enjoyed the opportunity for voting after church on Sunday. And that's a great thing. In fact, my wife and I have uh, participated in that as well. But one of the things that Ohioans enjoy is the opportunity to vote by mail. I talk about my, my grandmother. I, I've got a, a grandmother who's uh, almost 90 and she votes by mail, not because she's not able to leave her home, in fact, she's very active, uh, but because she likes the, uh, to be the most informed voter possible. She will flip open her laptop and sit there on her kitchen at her kitchen table and go through her ballot. And if she gets to a candidate that doesn't have a website, she'll call me and she'll say, <laughs> Frankie, tell me about Judge so-and-so before I cast my vote. Well, a lot of Ohioans enjoy that vote-by-mail program. Uh, one of the things, though, that we need to do to modernize that is that we need to put that absentee ballot request online. Right now, as it is, you have to print out the paper, mail it in in order to request your absentee ballot. There's no reason why that shouldn't be online. And here's a quick experiment for you. Ask around your office or your home uh, the 20-somethings that are, that are in your life. Ask them how many of them have stamps. Now, they know where to find them. They know they can go to the post office. They know they can go to the grocery store and buy them. But most of them just don't have stamps. It's just not a part of their daily life. That absentee ballot request should be online. And, and that's an easy thing that we can do, and I'm supporting that. And, and, and furthermore, Ohio should pay the, the return postage for those absentee ballots when they, when they get mailed back. It's a simple thing. <laughs> And this is funny, go to any county board of elections and many of them have this cork board where they've got ridiculous examples of people putting like a hundred one cent stamps on the front of the envelope. I was even at one where somebody had taped a bunch of quarters on the envelope as like a protest or something. 
we need to we need to make it easier, and and that's something that the state of Ohio can simply provide the postage for the uh, for the absentee ballot returns. Uh, the Fresh Start Initiative. It's no mystery to, to, to any of you, those of us that are engaged in elections issues, that there has been some level of consternation about Ohio's process of maintaining accurate voter lists. This is a process that goes back almost 30 years. By the way, it has been carried out by both Republican and Democratic secretaries of state, uh, but it doesn't meet the expectations that, that, that Ohioans have in many ways, and that's why I'm seeking to modernize it. But one of the things uh, that, that, that my office did when, when we first got there is that we realized, all right, here are these 270,000 registrations which were removed through that legal process that's laid out in the Ohio law uh, and, and by a decision made by the, the previous administration. Uh, again, carrying out the law as it's written and upheld by the court. Uh, but let's try to get those 270,000 activated again. Let's try to give them a fresh start. Uh, and so we did a mailing. Uh, one time thing, never been, never been done before. And we even put on there, here's your invitation to become a registered voter again in Ohio. Now, uh, un unfortunately, that only resulted in about 500 individuals that took that opportunity to become re-registered. That's important. 500 people matters. One person matters. Uh, but what it also showed is that there was a huge number of return to senders because what we know is that list of 270,000 registrations doesn't actually equate to 270,000 people because in most cases, many cases anyway, there are a lot of duplicates in there. There are a lot of, of, of deceased uh, or moved uh, and, and that kind of thing. And so this got me thinking about how do we fix this and how do we modernize this process? And that's why just this Wednesday, we announced, and, and Dan mentioned, uh, that uh, I'm pursuing with a bipartisan team, a piece of legislation that will create a more automated system for voter registration in Ohio. Now, what Ohio has, again, is this, is this sort of outdated system, and we can do better. And here's the basic vision for this. Anytime somebody comes into contact with state government, presents an opportunity to get someone registered to vote or to update their address. There's no reason why we can't do that. In fact, this, here's a story that illustrates what the expectation is that, that Ohioans have. Now, they think that in-state government we're more sophisticated than we are sometimes. Any of you that have interacted with state government or for that matter even local government, you know that sometimes we lag behind on, on technology and, and this is one of those examples. I talked to somebody that said, I went to my polling place to cast my ballot and they had an old address for me. And I said, well, did you update your, your voting address? Did you mail in the form to update your address? Or did you go on the Secretary of State website to update your address? And they said, well, no. But when I moved, I updated my address with the Ohio Department of Taxation because I paid my taxes and their state government and your state government. Why the heck don't you people talk to each other? It's a reasonable point to make, right? And so when somebody pays their taxes or gets a fishing license or receives services from the Department of Jobs and Family Services or uh, when they get their driver's license or update that little sticker for their, for their license plate, all of those present opportunities to update their address or to get them registered. And that's the kind of system that we want to see that would be an opt-out, not an opt-in. Here's what we mean by that. Ohioans deserve the right to choose not to register to vote for whatever reason. I hope they don't, but they, they may. And we need to provide them that, that opt-out. This type of a system is a win-win in, in, in this way. If you're concerned about voter fraud, and everybody should be concerned about it, even though it's, it's very rare, uh, we, don't, we don't take it lightly. Uh, it's very rare, but, but if you want to prevent voter fraud, the best way to do that is to maintain an accurate list. This would maintain a very accurate list. If, like me, you're concerned with making sure that every single Ohioan who is eligible, who is a citizen, has the opportunity to register and participate, then this also increases that opportunity to engage and to be civically engaged. And so in that sense, it's a win-win. We can increase participation and we can fight fraud all at the same time. Republicans and Democrats don't have to fight about this. Well, this is something we can agree on. And this is something that, uh, that I hope that we can, we can work together on. Uh, in the last few, few moments, I, I wanna talk about two things uh, that, that have been on my mind really ever since I, I, I started uh, in the state Senate. First, this idea that people of good faith can come together and can work together. And, uh, you know, I tell the story about when I was in the Army, and uh, I remember the, the, the drill sergeants have this classic sort of way with words. You've seen it portrayed in, in, in videos and, and, and that kind of thing, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, I remember this drill sergeant our first day, a bunch of kids from all over the country. We were milling around at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And he kind of growled to us. He said, I don't want to hear any of you people arguing about who's black and who's white and who's Hispanic and Asian and who's from the country and who's from the city. He said, you idiots are all green now. 
all green now. And I remember looking down at my uniform, and, and, and here's what they were saying. They weren't saying that you, you, of course you're proud of your heritage and where you came from and that kind of thing, but when, when you have a common purpose, such as the defense of your nation, when you have a common purpose that, 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 that is uh, more important than those outward characteristics, it can bring you together. And I think that we, as civically minded Ohioans, can have that kind of common purpose, where it doesn't matter uh, if you're a Republican or a Democrat, it doesn't matter the, the, those other uh, features. But what matters is that we're Ohioans and we can work together to solve problems. And, and, and here's what's key. Compromise is not a failure. I mean, where have we gotten this idea that somehow compromise is a failure? That's foolishness. Compromise is how statesmen and women solve problems. The difficulty that we have, though, is that there's no space for compromise because of the level of incivility that we have. What I mean by space for compromise, there has to be a basic level of trust and collegiality before there can be compromise. And when people spend all of their time rushing out to find a cable news camera or a blog to say crazy things to about the other side, that creates this level of, 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 of distrust that prevents us from governing. Civility is not about giving in or about uh, not arguing for your side. Civility is about creating that opportunity to govern. And this is why this is something that I'm so interested in. Thank you, Brother Bob. Yeah. The opportunity to govern requires it. And that's why we've worked hard at it. Uh, I, I'm part of a group called the National Institute for Civil Discourse. We've led these workshops around the country. There are a variety of things that stand in the way. Uh, perhaps a topic for, for another day, but uh, the idea of how we draw district lines has been a big problem for a long time. Thankfully, Ohioans have come together uh, to address that. And, and when we draw new district lines in 2021, we will finally have a more bipartisan uh, process that, that allows us to do that, but also the way that campaigns are funded. Uh, I think, as we all know, there are too many of these sort of single issue groups out there that can raise amazing quantities of money, but to access their bag of cash, you have to identify yourself with this sort of narrow single issue ideology, and, uh, and, and that causes a lot of problems as well. Um, let me finish with this. Raising the bar as it relates to our discourse around elections. I'm not naive about this, and I know that uh, this is a high-stakes game, and both Republicans and Democrats want to fight hard for every inch of turf that they can get, but we should stop talking down our elections. And here's what I mean by this. Far too often, you hear politicians on the right claim widespread voter fraud, when in fact, that's not true. But at the same time, you often hear politicians on the left claim widespread or systemic voter suppression. Let me be clear about this. Neither one of those is ever tolerable. People of goodwill should be able to admit or, or, or announce proudly, we will not tolerate fraud. We will not tolerate suppression. We'll do reasonable things to root those out and prevent them any chance we get. But when we beat the drum and say there's fraud occurring over here and there's suppression occurring over there and it's systemic and widespread, what it does is it corrodes the trust that the average Ohioan has in our form of government. It makes people not want to participate. And so let's be thoughtful about how we discuss our elections. In Ohio, we've got fair elections and everybody should participate. We can make them better. And I laid out a couple of the ways that we can make them better. And I hope uh, that, 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 that many of you uh, will partner with me on making them better. Uh, I noticed that, that we've got a, a number of groups of, of, of voting rights advocates here today. And, and I sincerely look forward to working with you all uh, in a partnership to make the way that we do voting in Ohio better. But let's, let's be thoughtful about how we talk about our elections. Let's reinforce the trust that Ohioans should have in our form of democracy. I encourage people to get involved, to become a poll worker, to, to, to engage in the process. And the best that, way that we can do that is to reinforce that elections really do matter. And that this energy that, that, that we have, that, that this passion that we have is a good thing. Uh, let's re re remind ourselves that Americans are still passionate about public policy. I've been to places where apathy uh, is the pervasive uh, uh, attitude. We don't have that. We're, we're still passionate about it, but let's, let's, let's focus that passion in the right way by getting civically engaged, by running for office, by supporting candidates we believe in, and by voting. And so here's my final pitch. 11 days until the next election. If you haven't taken the opportunity to vote, you're just a few blocks from the Cuyahoga County Board of Elections right now. So go and vote this afternoon as, as part of early voting. Or you still have time to request your absentee ballot. 
And if you don't choose to do any of that uh, on, on, on the 7th, uh, you will find at a friendly neighborhood location a group of your neighbors that will meet you there and work you through the process very quickly to cast your ballot and to make your voice heard. Again, it's an honor to be with each and every one of you today. I appreciate your passion for this issue, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Today at the City Club, we're participating in a forum with Frank LaRose, Ohio's Secretary of State. We're about to begin our Q&A with the audience. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club and our team will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today are Content Coordinator Bliss Davis and City Club intern Arimilo Orasanya. May we have our first question, please? Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm so, so pleased uh, to hear that you believe that every citizen in Ohio should have the right to vote. Um, there's a, a group of citizens who aren't aware of that, and those are our formerly incar incarcerated citizens. When they return to their homes, so often they don't know that they, their right to vote has been returned. I remember I was doing door-to-door -door voter registration, and I came across a gentleman who told me he had been in the joint mm -hmm. and he couldn't vote. And when I told him that he could, he actually had tears coming in his eyes, and I'll never forget that. And so my, my question is, what plans do you have um, uh, in using your budget, if necessary, to have a statewide campaign to make sure that formerly incarcer incarcerated citizens know that they could vote? We would mm -hmm. think the parole officers tell them, but so many of them have told me that their parole officers do not inform them, not, not painting the blanket, paint, painting all of them the same way. But often, they do not tell uh, formerly incarcerated citizens that they can vote. So do you have a plan? And if so, can you share that? Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. And also, thank you for your lifetime of work as, a, as an educator. Um, and uh, so this is something that uh, Ohioans uh, should be aware of. And, and it's not the case in every state, by the way. Uh, but in Ohio, uh, once you've done your time and been rehabilitated, uh, you are eligible to, to become a registered voter again. And we want every one of those uh, Ohioans, those restored citizens, as we call them, uh, to seize that right and, and, and to enjoy it. Uh, we have a program at, at our office uh, that's, that's just that. I think it needs to be made more robust. I, I met with a group of uh, primarily African-American ministers this week, uh, and this was one of the topics that we talked about, and I gave them a, a stack of these brochures, which is just a, a first step uh, for them to, to, to share with those uh, in, their, in their community uh, who may be in that circumstance. But you talked about what, what an empowering thing it is. For this individual who's made mistakes, and let's be honest, we've all, all made mistakes. Uh, we believe in, in restorative justice, the idea that, that, that people can put their lives back on track. A great component of that is to become actively engaged in your community, to become civically engaged by, by voting. Uh, and so that's something that I believe in. I, I'd like to partner with, uh, uh, with the Ohio Department of Jobs, or with the Ohio Department of Corrections, rather, uh, to, to make that part of the out-processing uh, that you do w w when, you, when you leave uh, state custody uh, and get released back to the community, uh, th that we inform people that they have that right. And then also to work with community partners, like some of the groups here, like some of the ministers that I spoke with, to make people aware of that opportunity uh, that they have here in Ohio. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming to the City Club. Uh, thank you for your service, and you will always get my vote as long as you uh, do not negotiate with Michigan. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, one of your first topics on cybersecurity, uh, you're probably aware of what's going on at Cleveland Hopkins right now. Uh, it's just causing a mess for everybody. Uh, but the other thing is, I, I believe in Cuyahoga County, um, uh, they cannot hack into the actually actual voting system. Is that the same way throughout the state? Yes, it is, and, and thank you for, for the question. And, and this, is, this is part of that being responsible about how we talk about elections. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is, is uh, what safeguards exist. For example, the machines that, uh, uh, that scan the, the ballots and, and tabulate the results are never connected to the Internet. A lot of people don't realize that. As I always say, the only thing they're plugged into is the wall outlet. And uh, th this idea that, that somehow uh, individuals are able to hack the, the, the way that the election is, is conducted uh, is, is false. Now, have there been attempts? You bet. 
Uh, but, but the safeguards that exist are robust. I always tell people also, if you've got a concern about this, sign up to be a poll worker. What you will see, and we're always looking for poll workers, what you will see is that there's an incredibly robust process where both Republicans and Democrats oversee, uh, the, uh, for example, the testing of the machines before the election. And then they're, they're kept under lock and key in, in a room where literally there's a Republican lock and a Democratic lock. And you have to have a representative from both parties to, to access that room once they've been tested and certified. And these are some of the things uh, that exist to prevent that kind of hands-on tampering with the election process. Now, again, have our adversaries attempted to uh, influence the election? Yeah, they've, they, they've attempted to do that through social media, through spreading misinformation, what we in the military would have called psyops, psychological operations, or what in a previous generation they would have simply called propaganda. Uh, they've tried to influence uh, what Americans think about elections, and one of the things that they have done specifically is tried to make us distrust how we run elections. If we're spreading that same kind of rumor mill, aren't we just doing the work of our foreign adversaries for them? And so that's why it's important that we be responsible. One of the ideas I've had, and I've talked about this with a few of the associations that represent the, the news media in Ohio, uh, is let's do a training for journalists. Uh, well-intentioned, hard-working people uh, that, that, that do a good job of informing the public. There's a reason why their job is protected by the very First Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, but in some cases, they're not elections experts. Uh, in most cases, they're not elections experts. And so what I envision is a program where before the election, uh, we, we can have in, in, in different parts of the state training. Bring them in for a mock election. Let them vote for their favorite sports team or favorite flavor of ice cream or whatever else, and then show them how the process runs and where the safeguards are along the way and let them ask questions on the record or off whatever they prefer let them ask those questions and get to better understand that process and because again these people are centers of influence that write the stories and write the blogs and do the television and radio reporting they will better understand how the process works and I think that's just one way that we can do that yeah Mr. Secretary glad to have you here today thank you very much I preface my question to you but to commend you for your comments about civility it, we, when, the word, when the word compromised is a dirty word in our discussion, we got problems. My question, I should know the answer to this, but I bet you the few others in here don't, don't know this either. You talk about automatically being registered to vote when you get your driver's license or your fishing license, and there are all these other movements to get people registered. How do we know that a person isn't registering more than once under different names, maybe different addresses? How do you catch that kind of a, of a fraud? Uh, thanks for the question. And, and so uh, the good news is that uh, the, the, um, the more automated process is actually better at preventing that than, than the old paper format or, the, you know, or, or what else exists. Um, if somebody fills out a, a voter registration form today, certainly many of those safeguards aren't there that you have when you're, when you're, when you're working with the state agency and, and, for example, the person's there in person. And so uh, the ability to verify identity, to prevent duplicate registrations and that kind of thing, that's a database crunch on, on, on our side to make sure that we're not creating duplicates. And that's, that's work that we can do. Fifteen other states have, have, uh, have gone down this road and we can learn from their experience. Some of them for several years have, have had a process like this. Uh, but one of the other things that comes up and this came up in the press conference I did just last week, or just earlier this week, uh, is citizenship. Clearly, if you're not a citizen, you can't register to vote. And, and we have very good safeguards in place to prevent that, including uh, a, a, a bill that we passed with bipartisan support that, that creates an annual check of the rolls to, to verify that against the, the, the rolls that we have at the Ohio Department of Public Safety to assure that only citizens are registered to vote. And so those are some of the basic safeguards that exist there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for your presence here today and for your wonderful words about the need for uh, civil discourse in our political process. Uh, I think we need that <clears throat> uh, without destroying the diversity of ideas, uh, but to allow them to come to a compromise. Uh, and I also applaud your... Uh, current efforts to work in a, bipartisan, in a bipartisan fashion. My question is, how do you plan to expand that mm -hmm. in this hyper-polarized environment that we have down in Columbus and throughout the nation? Yeah. Um, so you, you talked about diversity of ideas. And uh, one of the greatest concerns that, that I have as it relates to our civic life right now is that 
As I like to say, we've never had access to so much information yet been so uninformed. Uh, what, that, what that means is that, that we have this ability to sort of wrap ourselves in this little ideological cocoon where I only listen to radio programs and I only watch television programs and I only read journalism that, that sort of perpetuates my, my own views already. Uh, and, and, and the fact that, that, that we have created these, these bubbles where we're, we're not challenged in our beliefs. If you're not actively engaging with somebody who has political beliefs you disagree with, you're doing it wrong, honestly. You need to seek out people, and, and, and in, the, in today's age, it, you actually have to go out and find it. Uh, but you have to seek out people that have different political beliefs than you do and engage in challenging, difficult, but hopefully civil conversations. That's one of the reasons why the City Club of Cleveland is such a great institution and why for over 100 years we've, in this community, valued and treasured this citadel of free speech that we have here. But we need more like this, and, and that's, that, that's part of the, part of the solution. Uh, I think that, again, you know, the, the way that district lines are drawn, the way that campaigns are funded, all of this is, is, is part of that. But again, we have to actively choose, and it begins at home, right? With, with each and every one of us in the way that we raise our families and the way that we interact with each other and that kind of thing. Uh, the, the level of incivility that exists on social media is astounding. It's astounding. Uh, and it's starting to leak over into the real world. I mean, things that you would never consider saying to someone face to face, people say to each other on social media, if you ever want to test this theory, run for office, even at the local level. <laughs> It's, it's amazing, and people forget that there's a human on the other. It, it's this sort of dehumanizing pane of glass that people think that because they're, 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 they're tapping it on glass that somehow they're not hurting the feelings of another person, and that's, it's just not true. Um, and so, you know, th th that's part of it. But as elected leaders, getting to know, and this seems trivial to folks, but it's not trivial. Your elected officials should get together and have a beer every now and then. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with this, right? In fact, they, they should be interacting with one another. Opportunities for cross-party interaction are so rare, and that's a problem as well. And so finding those chances for people to have those, those cross-party interactions, all of this is part of it. And, and part of it is that we're sort of in a new normal, right? I mean, we are just still adjusting to the new paradigm of the way we communicate with each other. And some of those norms have not formed yet as a society. It takes a while for that to happen. Hi. Um, my name is Dylan Sellers. I work with uh, Fair Election Center's Campus Vote Project. Awesome. Um, I'm really excited about the, the opt-out version of uh, voter registration, uh, but my concern and my question is how does that affect state-run and uh, state institutions uh, where those students may not come into contact with state, um, uh, state agencies as often, but they still need the opportunity to register to vote um, and be opted out of that situation, um, mm -hmm. maybe by using uh, just their student ID card. That's an idea. Mm -hmm. But uh, how do you make sure that this opt-in program extends to the students who are living here nine months out of the year but may not be um, residents of, of sure. Ohio? Sure. Uh, part of that is partnering with, with Ohio's colleges uh, and, and, and the work that organizations like, like yours do as well. Um, but, but again, creating as many opportunities as possible for people to register to vote is the goal of, of this endeavor for me. And so, well, we have to sit down with this bipartisan team and, and hammer out the actual details of it. What I want to do, my vision for this, is again, create every possible opportunity for Ohioans to register to vote. And so if that would include uh, when you, when, when you uh, register uh, with, your, uh, with your college and, and that kind of thing, then, then that's something I would be open to as well. But it, it's, it's all part of the process as we hammer that out. But again, where we are today, uh, there are good opportunities, and we're talking about making it better. Online voter registration. I, I, I wrote that bill in Ohio that created online voter registration. It's resulted in well over 100,000 Ohioans registering to vote. We should be, we should be spreading the word. MyOhioVote.com is our website. If anybody, anybody that can hear my voice that's not registered to vote should go to MyOhioVote.com. It'll take you two minutes or so to, to get registered. So those are, those are the, the kind of things that we need to be doing. And, and part of it is just evangelizing myself. 
Um, you know, I've got this. I, I've got this megaphone as the Ohio Secretary of State, and whether it's I've got a Dr. Seuss book that I read to kindergarten kids about voting, and I've, I do it several times a month. Uh, I go to high schools and get people registered to vote. Just last week, I was at a high school in Cincinnati, in, a, in an urban area of Cincinnati, and we registered a bunch of students to vote. Uh, my office sent out thousands of these forms to high school history and civics teachers over the last couple weeks uh, that, 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 that they can distribute to their students to get them registered to vote. And, and I always tell people how exciting it is that if you're going to turn 18 before, if you're going to turn 18 before November, you can actually vote in the primary this May as a 17 year old. And that's a cool thing in Ohio. So uh, that's one of those, if you, if you know a, a young person in your life, encourage them to, to, to do that because that's something they'll be proud of the rest of their life. I voted when I was 17. Only few people can say that in Ohio. So next question. Hi, good afternoon, Secretary LaRose. Thanks for joining us here in Cleveland. Um, so really excited about your vision and your energy coming into this administration. One of the barriers um, that we see on the ground um, is access to the polls and the challenges with transportation. Um, I think it's no surprise to anyone in this room, uh, we invest a very low amount, I think it's 63 cents per capita in public transit here in the state of Ohio. So we know that there have been a couple of hundred polling locations closed. Um, I'd be curious to know how does you how does your office sort of reconcile analyzing uh, where public transit is accessible to mm -hmm. citizens um, and how does that fare into the decision to close polling locations yeah. and is there any thoughts of free public transportation on election day? Thank you for your question. And I served as Senate Transportation Chairman for four years and worked a lot with the Public Transit Association of Ohio. Uh, in fact, I was proud to get their Legislator of the Year Award because of I, I was working to fight for, for more funding for them. I, I recognize how important that is. The decision about what place is selected as a polling place and where is a local decision. So the County Board of Elections, again, two Republicans and two Democrats that sit on that County Board of Elections, make that decision. And my office doesn't micromanage that for them. I mean, they, they have to make that decision. So the advocacy and the concern about you know polling locations and where they are and that kind of thing uh, is, is most well-directed at, at the local level. Let me say this, though. Um, we want to see people take advantage of all the different opportunities that there are to vote. So voting by mail, making it uh, so that you can request that absentee ballot it online and then have the postage paid for is just one way. But for those that want to come out and, and vote, uh, th there ought to be more opportunities. In fact, it's interesting you mentioned this because just last week I was having a conversation uh, with uh, an executive from one of the scooter companies. Uh, you know these, these electric scooters that you see around? Some people love them, some people hate them. Whatever you think about them, I don't care. But the point is, um, I was saying, can, can, we, can we do free rides on, on, on election day? Uh, I want to talk with, with some of the ride sharing companies as well. Can we offer uh, free rides on, on election day? Uh, and, and that would be something that, that they would do. And, and so I think that, that all of those are, are cool opportunities. The fact is that, that at some level, the voter still has to take the effort to, to do it. I mean, you know, it's not gonna, we're not going to pick you up and carry you to the polling place and, and that kind of thing. But uh, you know, we can create greater opportunities for people to have that easy transportation. And those kind of public-private partnerships, like what I was talking to, where I'm going to try to talk to these companies about providing free transportation uh, on election day is just part of that. Yeah, yep. Thank you for coming, Mr. Secretary. I'd like to expand on inmate voting. In Ohio, if you're serving a misdemeanor, you can vote in jail. Years ago, I've been to the Warrensville Workhouse with Cuyahoga County and voted people. My question deals with the questions that, need to, that you need to answer to be registered to vote. You mentioned, are you a citizen? Will you be 18 on or before the next general election? And the one question that you, you should also ask is, have you been permanently denied your right to vote for repeated violations of the election laws? Correct. And I'm sure not many people know that. If you've been convicted of, of voter fraud, that's correct, that you can be, you can be denied your, your right to vote. And that's, uh, again, thankfully, that's exceedingly rare. Um, and, uh, and thankfully, that's something that not a lot of Ohioans are in that position. But again, you know, the, the focus of, of trying to get those restored citizens uh, the, the right to vote and try to create those convenient opportunities for those individuals to do that is one that I think is empowering for them and something that we should be doing. What a nice, positive attitude you bring to your office. I really compliment you on it. Thank I, you. You're, you're here to help people vote, and that's just great. Um, I uh, was a candidate uh, for office and have labored through the forms 
which require that even if the proprietor of a lemonade stand gives you a dollar, you get that dollar properly reported so that uh, there's full financial disclosure of mm -hmm. who's supporting you. Mm -hmm. I was thrilled to hear you say uh, quite briefly, but I think importantly, that you believe the sources of quote unquote dark money should be disclosed. Th this seems to me to be the same principle in action. If money is being contributed to a group or a candidate to influence an election, we should know whose money that is. <laughs> did I hear you correctly? You did. And uh, I'd also encourage you to read the op-ed that I wrote where it goes into some detail uh, that ran a couple weeks ago in, in the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Uh, on, on your first comment, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I, I sometimes uh, uh, I think that it's great uh, the simplicity that, that our children bring to, to things uh, in a beautiful way. Uh, my seven-year-old was asked a couple weeks ago, what does your daddy do for a living? And, and she said, he helps everybody vote. <laughs> Hadley got it right. I mean, that's what, that's what daddy does. Um, and uh, the idea about uh, transparency, uh, yeah, very clearly, anonymity is not a good thing when it comes to civic engagement. I don't get to do my job anonymously. Um, the reporters in the room don't write their stories anonymously. They put their names on them, and they have to own them. If they, if they do one really well, they get an award for it. If they make a mistake, they have to, they have to face the consequences of that, too. Anonymity in the public square is, 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 is a bad thing. Uh, the only time we should be anonymous is when we cast our secret ballot. When we pull that little curtain, I guess we don't pull curtains anymore, do we? When you go to the booth and you, and you, you, you cast your ballot, that's the only time, you know, the little wings there, uh, that's the only time that you get anonymity. Uh, when you're giving money, when you're engaging in that way, uh, it should know. Now listen, this is easier said than done. Um, because there, there are all these ways that people have of, you know, creating an LLC or doing this or doing that to keep... Uh, to keep their name off things, but uh, it's a problem worth solving, <laughs> and uh, and we can work in a bipartisan way uh, to to solve that problem. Yeah, brother Bob. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Secretary. First, I want to thank you and the City Club for allowing you to come and make a presentation that I've long awaited to hear in Cuyahoga County. I'm a past member of the City Club for several years, but I renewed my membership today because I knew you were speaking. <laughs> uh, but I want to make a public acclaim uh, for Mr. La Rosa. He not only speaks well, but he acts on it as such. I'm a military man myself. I spent eight years in the United States Marine Corps. He's a Green Beret, and I saw a soldier over here with all those decorations. So we're in good company. In the military, you learn about leaning on one another. And that's life. That's what America was based on, built on, in spite of, even when it was first formed, there was no slavery. But slavery came in afterwards. But we're on a path now that we can make a difference. In Northeast Ohio, we've had some very strong, committed politicians, elected and unelected, who made Northeast Ohio a progressive area in terms of not only politics, but in opportunities. And what you've laid out today I've been reinvigorated. I'm a businessman, as you know, okay? Yes, sir. I mean, I still actually been in politics. I see one of my fellow uh, volunteers at the Board of Election. We've been doing this for five or six years. There's no quitting us. And I want you to keep on keeping on. You'd always been our prayers to keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you. Well, thank you. Brother Bob, you said there's no quit in us, and I know that as a, as a Marine, there's never any quit in, in you. So thank you for, for all you do. Hello, Mr. Secretary. Uh, thank you for being here today. And thank you for the wonderful, knowledgeable things that you have offered for us today. Uh, we really appreciate all what you're doing, and we're proud of you and what you're doing and all your accomplishment up to this point. I wanted to bring your attention, as a president of the Cleveland American Middle East Organization, we have a lot of refugees that have been here, and they came from countries where there is no uh, no voting. They don't know what uh, democracy is all about. Mm -hmm. I would like to see more of the Secretary of State reaching out to our community so we can uh, let these people know the process and make them understand and uh, educate them how democracy lives, how the process of voting is, how the, the process of being an independent uh, uh, business person. Mm. So, uh, so I would like uh, to see if we can 
uh, have a, uh, something from your office toward our communities and uh, spread this and make sure that they are intact and how to promote this process. Yeah. Thank well, you. Hey, and thank you. And, and as you know, I've been to Cameo meetings, Cleveland Area Middle Eastern Association, correct? And, um, and, and it's, it's a great tradition that, that we've had uh, in, in Northeast Ohio, but all throughout Ohio, of um, helping new Americans become engaged fully in the civic life of, of this community. Again, my family's heritage is Italian. When we came 100 years ago, we had, my ancestors had to figure it out too. Uh, and, and, and so thank you for, for helping folks along the way. I know that uh, at the Cuyahoga County Board of Elections, they provide bilingual services probably not for many of the languages that, that your members speak, but they, they, they do. And uh, a couple of things that, that, that again, that I'm doing is uh, on, the, on the starting a small business side. L listen, immigration has been, legal immigration has been a net positive for this country. No question about it. No question about it. We need to help those people with that entrepreneurial spirit get started, uh, and, and our office can do that. For new citizens, uh, one of the things that, that, that my office is now doing is going to naturalization ceremonies. Um, in fact, I was having a conversation with a federal judge just a couple days ago about scheduling me to, to go personally to a naturalization ceremony. If anybody's never seen this, watching people raise their right hands and become an American citizen is the, one of the most moving things you could ever be a part of. And, and, and all of us that were born with our citizenship will have a newfound appreciation having been to a naturalization ceremony. I should come and get them registered to vote right there on the spot. And, and that's something that, that our office is, is going to do. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a forum with Frank LaRose, Secretary of State for Ohio. Our community partners for our program today include Cleveland Votes, the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, and the Ray C. Bliss Institute of Applied Politics at the University of Akron. We also welcome guests at tables hosted by Cuyahoga Community College and University Hospitals. Thank you all for joining us today. That brings us to the end of our program. Thank you very much, Secretary LaRose. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.